Today's sadness is a system, an assemblage of mind, body and technique. Capitalist accumulation is driven by organized optimism. Youth feel the anxiety, the stress and become sad about empty promises and diminishing opportunities. They are the experts at reading daily life through the sadness lens. This does not mean we should medicalize them. Every situation, every object and service can and will be sad. This is why we feel trapped and do not see how collective action can lead to change. Emotional rights are no longer experienced in solitude. The virtual others are always there as well. Intuitively, many feel that their mental mass is produced by society. It is not a sickness in our head. Capitalism is said to be able to deal with all these contradictions it produces. It is not. Predictable continuity is not just elitist. Escapist. It walks away from the dirty present, much in the same way romantics did in the industrial 19th century. How do we comfort the disturbed? Not by taking their phone away. What can we do that's liberating and prevents moralism? not about natural or artificial worlds, cutting straight through the postmodern lingo. The social is very real, messy, ugly, sexy and boring for most of the time. We can no longer delegate the management of the world to Silicon Valley. Mantle the free and invent new ways to work together and deal with differences and disputes rather than rehash them for the billionth time. Let's hope the content is halfway cool. Social media weariness, the cause of our tired eyes. What are the techniques of resignation that we are exposed to? The blissful ignorance after browsing an entire ecosystem of narratives is not surprising. Culture 
is a pendulum and the pendulum is swinging. The organized optimism hard-coded in online advertisements and other uh, forms of algorithmic advice turned out to be merely producing anxiety. As Caroline Carls Richard stated, what can't be cured must be endured. The suffering, sorrow, and misery is getting tagged and filtered by our own self-censorship. We've been captured and feel frozen. What we receive is the anger and anxiety of the online other. The growing imbalance in the dis distribution of digital enchantment is neither causing a revolution or revolt, nor does it fade out? Welcome to the great stagnation. We, the online billions, are stuck on the platform. according to what would make a great profile picture. You know exactly what your ex from 10 years ago had for breakfast this morning. You don't see the point in reunions. You already know everything about your former classmates, including the potty habits of their children. You ask your spouse, to change your Facebook password temporarily so that you can get some work done. You break up with your girlfriend by changing your relationship status to single. Ouch. If you want to know the results of a heat game, Marlins game or presidential election, you check everyone's status updates. job because you would be employers saw photos of you doing yellow shots while topless. Your lawyer uses your ex status updates in court to milk him for all he's worth. Your just out of jail childhood friend jacks your TV because he knows exactly when you check in at Coldstone Creamery every day. The cops tracked down your kidnapper because you checked in at the mall and had not been seen since. You've threatened at least once to end a 20 years friendship over the posting of a picture. Sister's friend, ex-boyfriend, says he liked your wedding dress. He wasn't at the wedding. Once we're locked in, the path to infinity has been blocked. Instead, we're caught in a Truman Show-like repetition of the perpetual now, toiling around in the micro-mess of online others that try to do their best, masking their failures and despair, like everyone else. Franco Berardi observes the mental state of today's students. 
I see them from my window, he writes, lonely, watching the screens on their smartphones, nervously rushing to classes, sadly going back to the expensive rooms that their families are renting for them. I feel their gloom. I feel the aggressiveness latent in their depression. In the social media era, the Oblomov position is no longer an option. In particular, for those that cannot economically afford to get stuck within the abyss. We experience the sadness of online existentialism minus the absurdity. If only interpassivity was ever really implemented in code, instead of being yet another Austrian idea, we could indulge in a permanent state of indolent apathy. Instead, there's nothing passive about human-machine interactions. Being on social, the Zen status of detachment is an ontological impossibility. We're never really lurking. Our presence is always noted, and we can, therefore, never truly enjoy the secretive voyeur status. Interaction is our tragic existence. Instead, we're constantly asked to upgrade, fill in forms, and rank our taxi drivers. arguments for deleting your social media accounts. Right now, Jaron Lanier asks, why do so many famous tweets end with the word sad? He associates the word with a lack of real connection. Why must people accept manipulation by a third party as the price of connection, he asks. According to Lanier, sadness appears in response to unreasonable standards for beauty or social status or vulnerability to trolls. Google and Facebook know how to utilize negative emotions more readily, leading to the new system-wide goal find personal ways to make you feel bad. There's no single way to make everyone unhappy. Compared to others, your ranking is low. And that 
makes you sad. Even technological sadness is a style about a cold one. The sorrow, no matter how short, is real. This is what happens when we can no longer distinguish between telephone and society. If we can't freely change our profile and feel too weak to delete the app, we're condemned to feverishly check for updates during the, free, the brief in-between moments of our busy lives. In a split second, the real-time machine has teleported us out of our current situation and onto another playing field filled with mini-reports we quickly have to investigate. Omnipresent social media places a claim on our elapsed time, our fractured lives. We're all sad in our very own way. As there are no lulls or quiet moments anymore, the result is fatigue, depletion and loss of energy. We're becoming obsessed with waiting. How long have you been forgotten by your loved ones? Time, meticulously measured on every app, tells us right to our face. Kronos hurts. Should I post something to attract attention and show that I'm still there? Nobody likes me anymore. As the random messages keep relentlessly piling in, there's no way to hold them, to take a moment and think it all through. Wow. 
break down in front of the drum. Delacroix once declared that every day which is not noted is like a day that does not exist. Diary writing used to fulfill that task. Elements of early blog culture tried to update the diary form for the online realm, but that moment has now passed. Unlike the blog entries of the Web 2.0 era, social media have surpassed the summary state of the diary in a desperate attempt to keep up with the real-time regime. Instagram stories, for example, bring back the nostalgia of an unfolding chain of events and then disappear at the end of the day like a revenge act, a satire of ancient sentiments gone by. Storage will make the, per the pain permanent. Better forget about it and move on. In the online context, sadness appears as a short moment of indecisiveness. A flash that opens up the possibility of a reflection. The frequently used sad label is a vehicle, a strange attractor to enter the liquid mass called social media. Sadness is a container. Each and every situation can potentially be qualified as sad. Through this mild form of suffering, we enter the blues of being in the world. When something is sad, things around it become grey. You trust the machine because you feel you're in control of it. You want to go from zero to hero, but then your propped up ego implodes and the failure of self-esteem becomes apparent again. The price of self-control in an age of instant gratification is high. zombie inside us, but we don't know how. I, our psychic armor is thin and eroded from within, open to 
behavioral modifications. Sadness arises at the point we're exhausted by the online world. After yet another app session in which we failed to make a date, purchased a ticket and did a quick round of videos, the post-dopamine mood hits us hard. The sheer busyness and self-importance of the world makes you feel joyless. After a dive into the network, we're drained and feel socially awkward. The swiping finger is tired and we have to stop. We should be careful to distinguish sadness from anomalies such as suicide, depression and burnout. Everything and everyone can be called sad, but not everyone is depressed. Much like boredom, sadness is not a medical condition, though never say never because everything can be turned into one. No matter how brief and mild, sadness is the default mental state of the online billions. Its original intensity gets dissipated. It seeps out, becoming a general atmosphere, a chronic background condition. Occasionally, for a brief moment, we feel the loss. A seething rage emerges. After checking for the tenth time what someone said on Instagram, the pain of the social makes us feel miserable. And we put the phone away. After a while, I ask, am I suffering from the phantom vibration syndrome? Wouldn't it be nice if we were all offline, 
Why is life so tragic? He blocked me. At night, you read through the thread again. Do we have to quit again? To go cold turkey again? Others are supposed to move us, arouse us. And yet, we don't feel anything anymore. The heart is frozen. Let's compare fleeting sadness in its technical form with the ancient state of melancholy. The melancholic personality seems to suffer from a disease. Unable to act, she withdraws from the world, contemplating death and other transient phenomena. While some read this condition as depression and boredom, others reframe this lazy passivity as a creative strategy, waiting for inspiration to strike. Instead of a fascinating derive into the vast arsenal of literary sources, I propose here a digital hermeneutics that shortcuts philology with the eternal presence of the digital that surrounds us. Melancholia, often described as sadness without a cause, has strong existential connotations. While paying tribute to Kierkegaard, who liberated melancholia once and for all of its medical stigma, describing it as the deepest foundation of the human in a godless society. The problem here is not of a vertical one, of going deeper, but a horizontal one. The democratization of sadness happens through its thin spread across our plateau. Homeopathic doses flatly distribute via technical means. Speaking truth to the platform. Speaking truth to the platform. Speaking truth to the platform. Great minds discuss ideas. Mediocre minds discuss events. Small minds discuss people. Premium mediocre minds discuss Bitcoin. Bitcoin.
Venkatesh Rao. Go down into the underground and pass from the hyper virtual fleshless world to the suffering flesh of the poor. Pope Francis. I can't believe video games are real. Sarah Hodge. We are not afraid of ruins. We plowed the prairies and built the cities. Can build again. Only better next time. in our hearts, Malatesta. Anyway, it's always the others who die. Marcel Duchamp. The internet is a metaphysical horror game, not a representational machine. And Buckner King. When defenders of this barbaric system talk about defending choice, they really mean the choice between bankruptcy and death. All science begins with fiction. Speaking truth to the platform. Speaking truth to the platform. Speaking truth to the platform. You read one email, you read them all. Andrew Weatherhead. I thought the dystopic future would be more exciting. And so sad today. Every time I think I've sorted out my life, capitalism collapses. Juliet. Once I was mine, now I am theirs. Sojana's book. All this time I thought I was a nobody. Now I'm just a runaway. Recession is when your neighbor loses their job. Depression is when you lose yours. Nicholas Lepin. Internet is the god that failed. Your chair. Bring up irrelevant issues as frequently as possible, CIA manual. We're not bored, we're boring, Snapchat saying. Melancholy is a thing of the past because there's simply no more time anymore to indulge in a wistful state. One could, of course, defend that techno-sadness still bears the possibility of melancholy. The implosion of the factor time has all but sabotaged the possibility to seriously drift off. Real-time machines constantly draw us back online, capture our attention, and do not allow extensive mourning. Strangely, melancholy requires concentration and focus. Distraction, on the other, is all over the place. And sadness is micro-dosed. The metric to measure today's symptoms 
would be time or attention, as it is called, in the industry. While for the archaic melancholic, the past never passes, techno sadness is caught in the perpetual now. Forward focused, we bet on acceleration and never mourn a lost object. The primary identification is there, in our hand. Everything is evident, on the screen, right in your face. While confronted with the rich historical sources that dealt with melancholia, the contrast with our present condition becomes immediately apparent. Whereas melancholy in the past was defined uh, by separation from others, reduced contracts and reflection on oneself, today's tristesse plays itself out amidst busy social media interactions. In Sherry Turkle's phrase, we are alone together as part of the crowd, a form of loneliness that is particularly cruel, frantic and tiring. What we see today are systems that constantly disrupt the timeless aspect of melancholy. There's no time for contemplation or wealth schmerz. Social reality does not allow us to retreat. Even in our deepest state of solitude, we're surrounded by online others that babble on and on, demanding our attention. But distraction does not just take us away from the world. This is the old, if still prevalent way, of framing the fatal attraction of smartphones. No, distraction does not pull us away, but instead draws us back into the social. Social reality is the magic realm where we belong. That's where the tribe gathers. And that's the place to be on top of the world. Social relations in real life have lost their supremacy. The idea of going back to the village mentality of the place formerly known as real life is daunting indeed.
how can we redesign the social in such a way that it will become impossible, even unthinkable, for trolls and bots, the tribe, to permanently disrupt our thinking and behavior to occur. We cannot spend all time and energy to reinvent the social without taking freedom into account. Not the liberty as defined by right-wing libertarians, but freedom as Hannah Arendt and Isaac Berlin speak about. This is not just freedom from addictive and manipulative software. Can we rethink bots and algorithms in such a way that, be, that they become pads and toys, tools, again, that work for us, instead of invisible, oppressive systems that try to deceive and educate us? Technological freedom means the ability for them to stay inside and to turn them off. We long for tools that assist us instead of colonizing our inner life behind our backs. Our sadness will not be overcome with anger. We need to reinvent, redesign, the techno-social in a radical fashion here, right now, in Amsterdam, in Europe. are not sick and not a valley patient don't cry because it's over smile because it happened pump yourself dump yourself we are not sick we are not sick we are not sick <laughs>
Um, Kurt Loving, John Longwalker, we are not sick. Um, the uh, records release party is going to continue after a short break of uh, 15 minutes with a Q&A. Um, but thank you so much so far for this uh, you know, quite amazing uh, performance. Thank you. And see you in a bit also online, 15 minutes. All right.
to uh, get a ticket for tonight uh, and also uh, those of you who are watching us uh, online. This again is the Amsterdam Alternative record launch of uh, We Are Not Sick with Gerd Loving, John, John Longwalker. Um, so uh, yes, um, this is the, 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 the Q&A and, &A, and uh, we are very happy to have you here and uh, again you know, still sort of uh, processing that very uh, you know, amazing performance that you just did. Um, let me do something a bit, uh, you know, egotistically, because um, for the Amsterdam Alternative Universe, uh, Geert Loving is uh, quite a, you know, well-known uh, name and, and character. He is the one who explains the internet to us and also tells us why, you know, we shouldn't use Facebook. <laughs> Um, which is great. Also, Geert, um, I should mention, has uh, a long article in, um, you know, this uh, the current issue of uh, Amsterdam Alternative, of which we are quite proud because you know it's out in print again. You know, after a Corona break that we had to uh, to take, uh, he is in here with a piece called "Delete Your Profile, Not uh, People." But John Longwalker, of course, is someone. Who we do we know a bit less. So maybe you know I can start with you, John, and uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about uh, how this collaboration, uh, you know, came, uh, you know, together, and uh, uh, you know how, how yeah how how, how yeah how does it, how did it happen? Who in the what is Johnny C? All right, uh, it's a great question. Thank you very much. This man was my teacher. Uh, I don't know. I've called him my mentor for years, uh, just because it makes sense, but. Uh, Anybody who's seen me in Amsterdam can thank him for my presence uh, due to, yeah, I don't know, giving me a reason to stay for the Zook Yard because I didn't have to search for shit. I already had a job. I couldn't do that job very well, but that's okay. You know, we all start somewhere. Uh, uh, peace to the, the uh, class of 2011. <laughs> Okay, um, but no, anyway, so let's just break it down. I came here to Amsterdam out of a social networking site. There was a link to a review about a book uh, of critical theory called Software Studies. And the idea behind the basic concept is uh, the shape of your tool shapes what you make with it. I mean, it's very obvious for anybody who's done any kind of craft work, but it's also maybe not so obvious uh, when those tools are used around you or on you and you don't even know. Um, so yeah, it was a completely random connection. I sent an email and then I ended up in this guy's class uh, because someone said, yeah, you know, this you can study. I thought it was just a bunch of dorks talking about media theory, honestly. I like, come from an open source software background, so I thought, oh, everybody's just doing this for fun. Like, I, it's incomprehensible to me, but uh, I'm glad they're doing it. Oh wait, they get paid? Oh, there's like uh, studies? Wait, what? So, yeah, that's how I ended up here to, uh, 11 years ago. Right, I mean, that, yeah, that's how we ended up in Amsterdam, and then the collaboration, how, how, how did that come about? Uh, okay, you want to take, like, how did this part of this thing start? Like, you were writing a yeah, book. Yeah, I mean, there was uh, some talk in our friend's uh, circle that um, we were going to do some podcasts, and then at some point, uh, yeah, we started to um, record some things. Yeah. And then uh, out of that, because the, the collection, which is now, um, you know, what we um, launched tonight here, uh, the album uh, is called Sad by Design. Yeah. 
uh, has seven tracks. Uh, and this is a selection of material that, uh, that we've uh, compiled, I would say over a two year period. So slowly, uh, and it's very easy because uh, we live nearby, so um, it's very easy to, to come over and uh, you know, do, do some, th some things, some recordings, listen to things and um, uh, discuss it. So uh, it grew very, very uh, yeah, organically. organically yeah. And, uh, and then um, I think about in, in um, last summer, uh, the summer of 19, uh, Impact Festival uh, in Utrecht approached us and uh, said, you know, do you want to do something? Was uh, that after your book launch? Yeah, it was right after the, the book, yeah. which is also called Sad by Design, came out. Yes. And then I said, no, I don't want to do a reading. Uh, why don't we, uh, you know, do um, a music theory uh, performance? Right. Uh, which we uh, kind of rehearsed already a little bit, only half an hour at the, the book launch here in Amsterdam. Yeah. Um, so uh, we said, yeah, well, let's just take the chance. And uh, then uh, in November, uh, it, we, we were the uh, closing act of Impact Festival. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then the big performance uh, was uh, a few months later, which uh, yeah, deeply impressed me because <laughs> we did this performance uh, for 800 people in the Volksbühne as part of the Transmediale Festival. It's an impressive building. Yeah, very. It's the Brecht Theater. In, in Berlin. Berlin. Yeah, it's incredible. Uh, I didn't know Stalin, uh, Stalinist uh, architecture was yeah, so Art Nouveau. Very it's pretty intense. <laughs> yeah, it is intense, the building. Uh, but th just to be here, uh, you know, in that space. Yeah, and then, of course, straight after that, uh, you know, uh, Corona happened. And now we're very, very happy that uh, even now, uh, even in the corona times, we can uh, do this performance. Yeah, uh, yeah, so yeah. It's been kind of an open invitation to do this uh, this year, uh, in a way, somehow, I guess. I, or at least it's been sort of like, uh, maybe we just assumed that we could <laughs> eventually throw our album party here. But somehow we've been sharing a vision since you know, that vision looked like uh, yeah, when we were building the songs for Transmediale and stuff, uh, yeah, there we go. Um, I had in mind, uh, you know, all these dance songs. Uh, help me here. <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, so you know, I, I'm envisioning myself. I, I, for some reason, I've always envisioned myself on this side of the stage. So I want to thank you here at OT301, everyone who is here right now. And in the stream, of course. And not in the stream, of course, but I mean the, the people who put this on. Um, and this is a space, you know, you guys make it sacred through your love and your hard work and devotion. And I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so, so yeah, go ahead. Thanks. Right, no, no, I mean, thanks. Yeah, yeah, no, we love doing that precisely, you know, for, uh, you know, these kind of uh, performances and, you know, uh, kind of, you know, artistic, uh, artistic kinds of uh, expression, but before but there's loads, of course, you know, to say about the content. But before we do that, uh, you know, this is um, uh, you know a record release party, and I believe that uh, the record is coming out on a number of different platforms uh, today. Is that right? Yeah, it should be everywhere, everywhere, all over, everywhere. Like, for yeah. instance, uh, just actually, we're top hits for all the single releases. <laughs> so if you search "Sad by Design" on YouTube, it's "Sad by Design." I think it starts with the Transmediale performance, which is confusing because there's a copyright hit on my own song from that stream, but then I didn't have the YouTube channel set up, so maybe I never got the channel, the strike. I, I haven't been able to remove it anyway, so if you do end up watching the Transmediale show, there's a big gap of silence at the beginning where we played the song that we ended with tonight. Right. So but also right after that is the single. Speaking truth to the platform the same way. Uh, we are not sick. We are the top hit for mm -hmm. that. But maybe you can list them. Let's uh, say yeah, YouTube. Yeah, Spotify, mm -hmm. iTunes. When you go to wearenotsick.com, we have the YouTube embed right there. So you can just listen to the whole album straight through just with one click. Right. What I also need to say, I think, is that um, we taped this uh, performance uh, tonight, of course. And it will be available uh, among other sites, I think, on the Amsterdam Alternative dot uh, nl uh, aside from well in a couple of days i suppose um, thank you 
Yeah, uh, and um, yes, so we are not sick. And uh, I mean, for those of, of you who have read uh, Geert's book, Set by Design, that came out uh, last year, right? Um, you will, you will, you know, some of the stuff that he, you know, you, you, you read, I think, is reminiscent or maybe was taken also directly, you know, from, uh, from that book. And, uh, and of course, you know, the book is more of a, um, you know, a, diag a you know, diagnosis, uh, if you will, right, of, uh, of our times and, uh, the, you know, the question of uh, the internet and social media within it. It's called sent by design, and then you come with this thing called we are not sick. Is that some kind of response to... Yeah, of course, because it is we are not sick is a very clear statement, and it's a reference to uh, Susan Sontag uh, and her uh, work on, uh, you know, uh, sickness, uh, AIDS as a metaphor, and so on. And um, uh, it's also saying that, uh, you know, the sadness uh, and uh, the whole online situation is not uh, something that, uh, you know, is uh, something that bothers uh, some individuals or, uh, you know, that uh, a small group uh, is, is, is sick, but all the rest, uh, you know. So, so the, we're not talking about a deviant group. We believe that this uh, stuff, uh, which, by the way, uh, you can uh, study now in the Netflix uh, documentary that came out uh, three days ago. Uh, it's called The Social Dilemma. It's a really big kind of uh, Hollywood uh, uh, production almost. Uh, in which all these characters from Facebook and Google uh, who have left uh, and who are now you know, on the other side, uh, who explain all these behavioral modifications and all these, uh, and who are in detail, the people who did it, explain in this documentary uh, that uh, we are all affected by uh, these um, uh, yeah, softwares and algorithms and uh, modifications and, of course, recommendations and so on and so on, mm. right? So the idea of, of we are not sick is not uh, that uh, it's a small group of people who feel, who feel this or that, right? But that it's a general condition. And it's true, uh, I have focused only on sadness I mean, some people ask me, like, okay, but there are also other feelings. And that's true. Uh, and I would love to, let's say, you know, study them all, such as anger, let's say, l loneliness, uh, really kind of more severe forms of, uh, of depression. Um, of course, in my work, I've already dealt earlier with things like uh, distraction. Distraction is a, is a really fundamental thing that uh, really affects, I would say, almost all of us. And it's not a small group of people that suffers from distraction, for instance. You know? yeah. So clearly, distraction is not an illness, right? Yeah. And that's the, the message we have here also. Sadness is not an illness. Yeah, I mean, the currency of today is, as Kerr pointed out, you know, it's attention. Or at least that's the metric that the people that, yeah, have the currency use and all. I don't know. I guess if I were to say anything uh, about we are not sick as a as a statement, is it's is meant to well, what it means for me uh, is no bird wears backwards wings. Mm -hmm. There is there's nothing wrong anywhere anywhere ever. I mean, yes, of course. So many things wrong, but are you to decide? And the lenses by which, you know, like uh, my ADHD diagnosis that I got during this whole process, uh, you know, really provided a language and a framework for understanding my past and my history and my, you know. But also, if all we say that ADHD is ADHD and we have encapsulated that thing inside of the language or uh, the medication. And the medication is real. I mean, like, there's just no way that I can do this world in this city uh, or at that pace 40 days a week without fucking 70 milligrams of amphetamines. And that's real talk. I mean, 
It's a lot better now than it was before. And that sounds extreme to people who don't have it, but I'll tell you what, I mean, just, just the point is, you've, if, like whatever it is that, that we are not sick with, that you are, you know, then we haven't felt that or, I just, I guess what I'm trying to say is we're not, we're not asserting that we are well, we're just saying that language means a lot and uh, we're not letting you call us that anymore. So that's quite interesting because, I mean, if we talk about sickness or illness in relation to technology, mm. I mean, what comes to mind, of course, is the work of um, the uh, French philosopher Bernard Stiegler, who unfortunately died uh, a, uh, a few weeks ago. Um, for Bernard Stiegler, you know, he understood technology as, as something that he, you know, uh, tried to, uh, uh, you know, sort of pinpoint with that Greek term pharmakon, pharmakon meaning, you know, a... Uh, medicine, but also poison at the same time. I mean, is, is that collaboration, you know, also a way to, you know, to, 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 to find like a medicine, you know, or to find some kind of, um, uh, you know, pharmacon, uh, you know, in, in the, to, to develop a kind of pharmacology. Uh, 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 yes, within so certainly, kind of, you know, uh, in my own work, uh, the pharmacon would be, uh, Maybe not, uh, let's say, a poison and medicine, but uh, critique and alternatives. And for me, the pharmacon uh, brings them always together. So it's not just the social media critique. Huh? Always in everything uh, that we do at uh, the Institute of Network Cultures, a very small uh, unit uh, within the Hogeschool van Amsterdam, uh, we try to do uh, both. Huh? And uh, so also in this, uh, this performance, uh, it's not just a protest song, let's say, against Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, obviously, uh, yeah, I mean, that's what you could do. No, we have a different track yeah, for that. I mean, it's what wait. you could do, but, uh, yeah. uh, but we also feel by, by you know, doing kind of artistic uh, collaborations is, uh, is that for us, uh, there's already something, a way out uh, in, in there. And, uh, yeah, mm, some people have said, okay, you, you can make a diagnosis, as you said, yeah, it's a psych uh, diagnosis, uh, that's, that's uh, very um, accurate. It describes the zeitgeist, is, that's, that's good. But mm, can we extract from this diagnosis the medicine, right? And this is, mm, that's hard, right? Um, and. In my experience in the last uh, decade that I've been uh, active in this field of uh, you know, developing and experimenting social media alternatives, I've seen uh, a lot of uh, you know, good alternatives, but uh, we're still very small. We're a small group uh, of people, and uh, the, the vast majority uh, is, in our uh, terminology, stuck on the platform, right? Uh, and yeah, we have a Google the, embed the, for the yeah, album. The, and the, it's just a, it's because a, that's the only way that everybody can hear it for free, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, so uh, we're stuck, and it's really necessary uh, for those who, you know, develop alternatives. And this is an evening about Amsterdam alternative, and I'm very much part of that. Um, to ask ourselves the question, okay, we develop alternatives, but why is the vast majority of people uh, that, that surround us, uh, why are they stuck, right? And uh, yeah, the, in the last couple of years, I've have indeed spent more time uh, on, on that uh, question and uh, this performance, all the material here uh, is a direct result of that. Do you wanna come in on that as well? Uh, yeah, no, I think I think you're right on the money with the uh, the pharmacon. I, um, you know, it, to me, it, it's uh, it's easy enough just to to uh, include in your conceptualization of medicine that all medicine is poison. I mean, yeah, I mean, yes, exactly. The ADHD diagnosis and the medication is not for a normal person, and you would not do well under those conditions. So it's, but I can also remove myself from this environment 
thanks to a beautiful invitation to, uh, yeah, a slice of paradise um, that I've never seen, but I know is there. And um, that's another way to treat it. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I think, you know, the um, one way of uh, dealing with that stuckness, of course, you know, is, I mean, in, you know, traditionally in the Netherlands, and in particular in Amsterdam, you know, was squatting, right? To sort of open up, uh, uh, I mean, this is of course, you know, not just related, or, you know, it's rather not related to a digital space, but to real space. Um, and also, you know, with, uh, with Amsterdam Alternative, I mean, what we're trying to do is to, uh, is to open, uh, you know, in, in, in all kinds of, you know, collective ownership uh, and so on and so on, you know, not just the question of uh, digital platforms, you know, to address these issues. And I also, you know, uh, want to extend the invitation to those, uh, you know, who might be interested here in the room or, you know, out there uh, <coughs> in the digital shallows um, to join us, if you like. Uh, we're always looking for, for writers and contributors to, to Amsterdam Alternative or join us for one of the many projects. Um, our website is uh, www.amsterdamalternative.nl. I would like to open uh, uh, up now for you know questions from the from our live audience here, uh, if I may. Is, if, can I see um, hands, please, if you have a comment or a question? Shall I repeat that question? Please. So, what do you think of e-boys and e-girls? Uh, uh, I'm actually not familiar. Can you? Can you? Pre pre I'm. I, I'm sorry. I, you have to come here. And yeah. Yeah. You, now. Now. Now you're on stage. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Hi. The only thing is with the. You have to be careful with the mic. Oh yeah. Great. Okay. It's not really. Okay, we'll have to oh yeah. Like shit. Okay. Yeah. So. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so e-boys and e-girls are, I, I know them mostly on Instagram, but I guess they're also on Tumblr and other uh, internet uh, places. Um, and the thing is, they have this like sad aesthetic, sad online aesthetic. Oh, you know them? Yeah, I've seen them, don't worry. Okay, <laughs> yeah, so uh, I don't really, uh, I didn't read anything about it yet, but I was thinking, uh, I could link it, of course, to set by design, yeah. and um, I was wondering, how do you think about it? Please, thank you. Um, so that, that's the power of language right there. Uh, that's a subculture that Gert and I, I mean, that's, that's kind of where the collection of memes comes from. And so Gert is quite familiar, I'm sure he'll, he could uh, fill you in on as many details as he wants. But uh, the, the power of language is there is, now we can talk about it, e-boys, e-girls. Yeah, uh, th these are uh, kind of small but very strong uh, subcultures, and um, uh, you know, d d there's been uh, many, many, uh, let's say, places where they, where similar manifestations have uh, happened before. Um, however, a lot of people kind of trace it back, let's say, to manga culture in uh, in Japan, uh, in probably in the 80s and 90s. And uh, this is also why uh, a lot of, in a lot of uh, the, the subcultures, we see that visually speaking, uh, you know, a lot of the references go go back uh, there. And there are probably not so many uh, places, let's say, in Western culture, where where we allow huh, this to to express, right? Um, so the, so there, yeah, that that's a. Of, of course, it's changing. It's changing a little bit. Um, and Billy Eilish, uh, of course, and I, I, sh I, sh I showed her, her and yeah, um, I'm a big fan of uh, her work, of, of course. Uh, so sh she is someone who is uh, open to it. There, there are many others. Uh, in, the la in the past five years, in let's say music culture or pop culture, uh, who have opened themselves up to a dark side inside themselves. And this has really strongly resonated uh, with, um, you know, with, with young uh, people. And some have taken uh, this up and have started to cultivate it. And um, yeah, I have studied uh, all these subcultures for sure, and I still do. Uh, and the, funny enough, there the, the question also comes up which I addressed before, the strategic question, like if you go 
through the sadness, if you open yourself up to these dark sides um, of depression or melancholy, give it a name, right? Will that eventually then free you or will it op open up? Right? Or will it take you further down into the abyss? And this is a very uh, important and strategic question uh, for, for us and for many of us. Uh, mm. Um, because, okay, to deny it, it's probably not good. To cultivate it, yeah, some people will uh, benefit from that. Uh, but, yeah, it's, of course, much, much better to overcome it. Huh? So the question then becomes, how can you overcome this? How can you, uh, how can you escape? Uh, and there, uh, you know, the piece uh, I wrote in Amsterdam Alternative is a, is a very contemporary, uh, let's say, manifestation of that. It's a piece I wrote uh, in, um, in August uh, last month, and it simply deals with the question, how do we relate to cancer, cancel culture? Uh, you know, and so um, there you can also see, like, okay, we need to discuss this you know, together uh, and turn it into a, a public manifestation and a, and a debate. Otherwise, it will remain our own personal problem. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Uh, just one thing to add to that, because you were talking about sh the, the, the going into the dark places. And I think there's a lot of misapplication and, or misconception. And, um, you know, uh, it's one of these things about language and all. Uh, so I won't go into it deep, because it's, it's, uh, it's massive. But more or less, uh, what I have found to be the most uh, accessible language for actually dealing with all of like trauma and or yeah, see trauma, right? Like trauma, trauma. It's still happening to you, but it could be medicine. Everything that is medicinal was poisonous, you know. And maybe you took a huge dose, and it takes a long time to get over the poison, a long time. But in the end people who have gone through that and is medicine, then they, they don't regret a thing. Okay, next question, please. Who wants to? Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll just repeat your question, that's fine, yeah. Yeah, that, I, I think that's a brilliant question. I mean, the, the, the question is uh, the, the, the difference between sadness and um, melancholia, and particularly in relation to different uh, subcultures. Uh, the, uh, you, you, were, you were putting these uh, manga and uh, other 80s subcultures in one corner and that kind of new stuff uh, the, the, that you were mentioning, uh, net girls, net boys, right, in, in another. And I think, yeah, there is something. Yeah. Of course, the... There's an enormous richness of sources uh, and also traditions, different approaches to melancholia. So if you dive into it, you know, you re literally start with the old Greeks two and a half thousand years ago onwards. And, uh, and then there is a very, uh, uh, let's say, intensive time again in the late Middle Ages and um, Renaissance. And then... Uh, uh, it's really uh, dealt with again in a different way in the 16th and 17th century until, uh, let's say, the medication uh, really starts to come up in the 19th uh, century, right? And, um, uh, and then uh, in the 20th century, we, uh, we s still see people 
uh, expressing it, writing about it, but it's a little bit unclear. Um, very often, um, uh, it's almost uh, as if the feeling itself historicizes itself. And, you know, when you're melancholic, you kind of put yourself back in a state that was there uh, in, you know, in, the, in previous centuries, uh, but not necessarily in deep, deeply rooted in today's culture, right? Um, and so, um, yeah, it is still for me a fascinating question, you know, it, it, uh, what, what could be melancholia in this online age, right? Um, I looked very carefully into it and I, and I didn't really find uh, so much of it. Um, especially uh, if you look at it from the perspective of the social media. And there I emphasize the fact, the simple fact of uh, speed, acceleration, uh, change, swiping, liking, uh, yeah, the, the, the enormous pace in which things uh, are passing, which uh, is completely opposite of, of the deep, let's say, uh, mourning the state of the melancholia, which is, uh, you know, anything but fast, anything but, uh, uh, you know, changing. No, you, you're really, really uh, stuck and you go very, very deep. Um, and uh, the social media are uh, constantly uh, disrupting uh, this, this, this process of, uh, of reflection, of, uh, of mourning, of uh, meditation. And there's, of course, many, many forms uh, of it. Um, so, so it takes us in, in the current, uh, uh, let's say, 24-7 um, culture uh, in which uh, things travel with the speed of light. Um, it takes us an enormous effort uh, to uh, shield us off and uh, to focus, to concentrate, and to really process things in a deep, in a deep way, right? And we could say, okay, that already started with the newspaper, radio, television, film, and so on and so on, right? The pace of that really already took up uh, in probably already in the 19th century and really accelerated. Uh, in the 20th century, uh, and um, we're, we're now in a, in a culture, uh, you know, in which uh, every uh, communication uh, is uh, in real time. Yeah. Yeah, now's already over. Get over it. Yeah. <laughs> right. Goodbye. Can Go I? Yes. Uh, no, I just, uh, so um, the language that I'm talking about is alchemical psychology. Um, it's sort of a, you know, uh, an offshoot of the work of James Hillman, um, who is like the disciple of Jung, who didn't care about proving shit to scientific psychology and psychiatry. And he's the one that has gotten the farthest in healing and medicine, in my opinion. The, forming, the formation of uh, alchemy, it, the, medical language is a diagnosis, you are this, and okay, does it ever end? Is there a way out? Is there what's, or do I have options? Or, you know, it's like, well, uh, you are this. And I think, um, in fact, melancholia and sadness, I mean, the thing is, like uh, what Herod was writing about, anything and everything can be called sad, you know? It's a, I mean, it's even a, a way to make yourself cooler than the next person. Just call that other person sad and move on. Uh, just... <sighs> Alchemical psychology changes things from being permanent or, uh, 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 yeah, affixed. But it, it, it basically, I'll just leave it at this: is the language of the sensory fantastic, and so you're talking about shapes and smells and colors and melancholia. To me, could be a alchemical moment that you need to go through to transmute from one thing to another, perhaps. Um, I'm not saying that melancholia, it looks like there's a way out, I don't know. But I'm just saying that sadness is, uh, yeah, it's, it's something that 
yeah, they're just too, they're, 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 uh, they're interrelated, but um, I would say that, yeah, sadness is, um, uh, sadness is, is, is by design, and uh, melancholia is almost more of a choice, and that's the difference. Next. Okay, another question? Yeah. Yes. Shall we do the shouting? Uh, yeah, yeah, I can shout. Like, can you hear me? Yeah. Now, I do have a question because I was wondering uh, like if, if the design of the platforms and the machines themselves uh, raise us uh, somehow into sadness, to feel sadness. Yep. And if you want to prove uh, the old binary offline life is better than online life, my question is. Is there a way uh, to actually use the design to actually trigger, if you, if you want to use this word, but a mechanical yeah. process? Uh, yeah, I'll just leave it. So the question is, uh, if the... Yes. So if the if the machines are you know if it is the uh, machines design that gives us sadness, can we also use the kind of technology, yeah. not just as poison but also you know as a as a sort of healing mechanism, to overcome sadness or even yeah. produce joy? Uh, I think it's uh, uh, very uh, clear that it's uh, possible, and uh, this is the big debate that is happening at the moment in uh, Silicon Valley, uh, because they want there uh, to dismantle, let's say, these feedback loops that are constantly uh, watching you, registering what you do, and then offering you something to, to make you more, uh, more sad, more curious, uh, you know, the whole um, recommendation uh, systems, uh, the dependency on likes, and so on, so on. This is all uh, designed. Uh, and behavioral science is playing a very, very uh, strange and dubious role uh, in this, also interaction design, uh, of course. Um, and uh, I think it's, it's absolutely possible, and uh, I think the fundamental step we need to take is to take the, the online uh, software, the apps, and the platforms, the networks, back to uh, the level of the tool. Uh, because once they were tools, hmm, and we don't need to be nostalgic, uh, because we can develop new tools, right? We don't need to go back, uh, let's say, to email or telnet or, uh, and so on and so on, right? This well, is maybe not, we should. Th that's not, uh, that, th this is not, uh, yeah? I'm not saying we should uh, use uh, MS DOS again or something. You know, that is. I'm not. Uh, um, you know, in that sense. But uh, to see these things again as tools would really, really uh, liberate them, because tools, for instance, we can have ourselves. We can change. Right? But there's nothing in the social media environment that we ourselves, for instance, can change. Right? That's, these are. Uh, all encompassing, all uh, overwhelming environments that understand us so well, and they're so automated. They're so. In, in my book, and I describe this as a, in, uh, as a process of uh, technology becoming subconscious. Right? Uh, we don't even notice it anymore. It's so interwoven. Yeah. If we bring it back to the level of tools, we'll have to, uh, we can start to uh, use them mm -hmm. again, you know? Can we use Facebook? I don't think so. Facebook is using us. This is already known, well, very well, well known, right? Among everybody, this is kind of uh, a consensus. However, uh, you know, how, how to, you know, get out of this? Well, by developing, you know, new tools that uh, will not use us. Okay. Yeah, just to drop in a little bit more uh, on top of that, like, uh, just the fact that, in a way, uh, we kind of run, like, there's a the capitalist psycho, like, uh, like kind of crazy psychosocial control, control structure built on top of uh, software that was contributed out of, like, 
kind of an ideological space of like, uh, if you don't have control over the workings of the machine, then the machine will have control over you. Uh, Richard Stallman. Mm -hmm. So the idea here is hilarious because it's also, what is it? Free, <laughs> right? So guess what? That's what they use. And in reality, a lot of technical choices have been made just out of price alone, just out of efficiency costs. There, there's calculations made with floating point math that if you change them will, uh, yeah, could kill somebody with radiation or make your machine not work. So anyway, basically what I'm saying is uh, literacy with development and all that kind of stuff, I think looking backwards actually into some of computing history and seeing these forks in the road and looking at them more carefully, how they went, what they went through, why is it that this handheld mobile re revolution is the first technological framework shift that hasn't resulted in any, any, any shakeups of the existing monopolies. IBM like basically got kneecapped by the mini computer. Then all the mini computer companies got kneecapped again by the PC, the microcomputer. Next. That's what it made, like, just is going there, on. Is there another uh, question? from the audience. Yes, please. Yes. Yeah, are there examples of uh, tools that do not use us, but that are actually used by us? The Postal Service. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, no, I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, an, uh, a preacher of the uh, of the offline. Uh, I, I don't think, uh, especially in Europe, this is uh, this is the way uh, to go. Um, we need to uh, really re redesign uh, the uh, existing. Uh, I, I think, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of collaborative software where uh, you know, for instance, you start from from a group and you say, okay, what do what for instance, we are here in this room, uh, OT301, etc. What do we want to achieve? What do we want to do? Right. So we don't start with the, the idea of the platform. We start with the question: What needs to be done? What do we want to achieve? Hmm? Uh, um, do we? Yeah. Uh, what needs to be done? Uh, what right. needs to be done? Yeah. And uh, th this is a complete other um, uh, starting point from, uh, let's say, the marketing logic. Uh, which is, uh, you know, driven by, um, let's say, advertisement and ultimately uh, profit. So, uh, so, so yes, the the tool uh, character is is important. Uh, for instance, do you want to write a text together? Do you want to, um, um, for instance, uh, you know, arrange uh, a time and place uh, to meet? Uh, do you want to uh, have, a, have a discussion, right, and, and, a, and a debate? I don't think that the current platforms, to be honest, are really made for, for, dis for discussion. Uh, we know that because every discussion, you know, on Twitter or anywhere, uh, you know, is immediately, uh, you know, bringing in a lot of trolls. And, um, and nowadays, you know, people are, to have a real dialogue amongst uh, themselves, they have to hide, you know, in in secret WhatsApp groups. Mm. You know, th this is where we ended up, which is of course also owned by by Facebook. Uh, but yeah, it's no longer possible, for instance, to have a larger open uh, online uh, discussion uh, because we know what what's going to happen. Uh, so th the polarization uh, is such uh, that. Uh, we can't even stage, you know, the differences, and it's important, you know, to f for us to disagree, to say, okay, but you know, we shouldn't do A. We, let's let's look at uh, possibility B. Let's discuss Plan B, right? But where can we do that, right? Wouldn't you say that the, I mean, the question in itself, I mean, is something that is uh, very important uh, without, you know, you being able to, you know, give a concrete answer other than, you know, alternative social media platforms. But I think, wouldn't you say that there's, you know, this is a task 
uh, uh, you know, that is worthwhile getting into for, you know, design students, young designers to think about the question of, you know, what kind of internet, what kind of platforms do we have? I mean, we, oh, for sure. we I mean, I have, I, I, I'm, I'm involved in, in, you know, research projects with, uh, you know, young designers who ask that question. I mean, there's one, for instance, one Chinese uh, researcher, Yin, I, Ivan Yin, you know, she is asking the question, can you urbanize the digital, right? And she's, she's talking about you know, different degrees of two-dimensionality because you could say, okay, the virtual is two-dimensional, but there was a moment you know, when that two-dimensionality was you know, broader than it is now. And uh, like, you know, like Gert said, you know, going back to that moment when, more, when, you know, when there was this kind of tall character to, uh, to, the, to the internet, it's not melancholia in itself, you know, but it's sort of looking, okay, you know, are there in the past kind of moments, ways in which, you know, these things were designed that we could sort of rediscover and then, you know, not go back to the tool, but, you know, move forward to, to, to kind of tools. But that really requires our collective, uh, you know, thinking and, 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 and making, you know. And we're not doing this because what, does the, what, what do platforms do? They individualize us, right? I mean, you know, everyone is on their own, alone together, right? That's what you quoted Sherry, Sherry Turkle. Sure. Mm. Right. Mm. But, you know, if you go and look for alternatives, uh, there are already a lot. So if, if you are interested, let's say there are, for instance, very good alternatives for Google search engine. There's uh, amazing uh, uh, alternatives already for, um, um, for instance, uh, let's say uh, Google Docs or something like that where you work together. Uh, but there's one thing uh, which I think still lacks, and this is the big question, right? How do we design the social online? So, um, and I have not really seen uh, so far uh, really, um, you know, groundbreaking new alternatives uh, to that. Uh, and, and, and that's what I mean with uh, we're stuck on the platform. The, this is a very serious, uh, serious issue which I think is the most urgent one. And so uh, I would call for everyone, uh, you know, to get involved and redesign uh, the social. It's very, very important. Can we have one more question? Or did, did you want uh, to add? No. Okay, last question. Yes, please. Probably uh, Extinction Rebellion and uh, the protests against uh, yeah. climate change. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I know. Yeah. To be honest, I let I, me repeat I've the question first because yeah. otherwise our online audience doesn't know. Yeah. What, we're what talking I uh, about. so the question is the question is mm. you know what are your thoughts on wokeness and particularly. <laughs> because lots of it seems to take place exclusively online. Or in, in, right, that's what you're saying, yeah. Um, oh, very small question, yeah, please. Yeah, but, you know, please uh, read what my, uh, the essay that I wrote uh, last month. Um, and, you know, delete, uh, delete your profile, not, uh, not uh, other people. Um, that's the title. Um, and yes, I... I, 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 I think, uh, for instance, uh, to exclude dissident voices or uh, deviant behavior uh, has always been with us, right? So I don't think that we're gonna ban that or we're gonna um, do away with it. Uh, and we also know that, especially if things collapse, if they fall apart, if, um, movements or uh, subcultures uh, go downhill. We also know that the, you know, the, the forces of disintegration uh, really cause groups to really uh, not only fall apart, but 
uh, actively expels uh, uh, others, and uh, yeah. So th this is a, this is an, an almost necessary um, given in a, in a time when things fall apart. However, these days <laughs> we're we're living in uh, you know the age of uh, of the internet of social media, right? So we then have to kind of combine the two things. What happens if we go downhill, if things really rapidly fall apart, and we have social media, right? And this is, uh, this is what, where we are, and this is where the, the, the question of uh, cancel culture, wokeness, and so on, uh, becomes so important, because if only we could then, you know, now uh, build a wall and say, okay, here we have our own discussions and you know things went wrong look at the school you know uh, the, the discussions uh, internally in the in the group and in the in the club uh, about everything uh, that uh, you know went wrong uh, people that were uh, uh, pushed out discriminated and so on right this is a very real discussion but we cannot build that wall and say, we just have this discussion, which is a legitimate one, but <laughs> we keep it outside of the social media. And this is the problem, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we can't. Immediately, almost overnight, uh, things uh, circulate, things accelerate, things uh, become much more radical, much more, um, yeah, I mean, literally thousands uh, can can get involved over, overnight, right? In something that is happening in a rather small uh, small group of people that want maybe have even a desire to have a real fight over a real issue, right? Because the issues are real. Racism is real, right? So, uh, so, so it's not like, oh, please don't talk about it. <laughs> no, we have to talk about it. Uh, however, uh, at the same time, we don't know how uh, to deal with the fact that the immediacy uh, uh, is with us, almost on the spot. From an American media landscape, I would say that we're in a really tight position where, uh, I mean, we used to rely on what was called the fourth estate, I mean, an actual market of news. And I think there's now three, maybe four players, I forget, but. It's, it's ridiculous, uh, the level of control um, that small corp corporation, and this was law, I mean, this is stuff that we can change back in the US anyway. Um, but the, like my point is just that like we, I, I, I wonder sometimes if social networking is just a scale issue. I mean, like you put 100 people in a room and be like, hey, it's all world peace or whatever. I mean, okay, sure, uh, but so I mean, Maybe we can look back to older methods and older ways of getting together in, in, in sizes of people, groups that, you know, and then you go and you sit down and with another size, like, a, you know, it's a big group, but you go through it in a smaller way or something. I think that the, the, the real shift does have to involve uh, physical socialization because that's what we haven't invented yet, the way to handle all this shit, you know? I mean, and we've gotten some stuff, you know, like that, the, the signs of social media addiction that we play towards the beginning of the set is uh, it's reflecting of that. Huh? It's like it's, it's, it, it has little metrics of, that are, you know, from a time and place of just how it looked like at that moment. Um, and yeah, so I guess, yeah, from what I have to say is just that there's a lot of like really important fights. Just be careful with the language that you're using and who you're speaking with and for, because it's, uh, it's a really confusing world out there, and um, my thought is just, you know, we have lost people, we have found people, and if you haven't found yourself, then stop fucking calling other people lost, too, or just recognize yourself and move forward, yeah? Like, just don't walk around acting like you know what the fuck's going on. That's what we're asking. So thank you very much. I think that concludes uh, our event, our de de record launch of uh, We Are Not Sick. I, 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 you know, I also liked your uh, backward wings. Uh, uh, thank you. you know, That'll be in um, another song. Is important. Yeah. So let me, let me, let me, let me remind you of um, if you know.
Uh, no, we'll, we'll have to talk to you about it in the bar okay. because I can I can actually show you the people that caused it. For those happen. of you, but to sum it up in a word, magic and following my heart. Very good. For for, for 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 those of you who are uh, you know who haven't got all the answers, uh, I recommend uh, Gerard's book, uh, Set by Design, or you know the article that was uh, quoted, which can also be uh, accessed on uh, our website uh, www.amsterdamalternative.nl. And again, you know, uh, extending the invitation for you know people who are interested to contribute to uh, one of our projects. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gerard Loving, uh, John Long Walker. Thank Maybe, you. Uh, Last, uh, and OT301. OT301. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.